Okay, thank you. Thank you. I'm, I'm really honored to welcome all the, the speakers who have given their time uh, to enthusiastically share their findings and their works. And welcome also the participants for uh, actively try, trying to participate in the, in the, in the workshop. Thanks to the organizers and supporters, and especially to Thomas from Atos, who has uh, consistently given us the support tirelessly, and uh, Victoria from Ogilvy, and uh, Daniel from ITE, and Dorothea from EIT Digital in terms of disseminating. Uh, I just want to mention a couple of uh, logistical points. Uh, all of you, uh, when you want to talk, you can unmute yourself. Uh, and the video, you can also share the, the video, the cam your camera when you're talking. Please keep to, uh, to time. We have already lost about four to five minutes. Uh, the discussion times will be separate in two sessions. So uh, keep to your time. And when you have good questions, also try to make it sharp. Uh, we'll have a 15 minutes break. Uh, from time to time in the speech, there will be a poll that will be launched. Uh, hopefully that you, are, you will participate in it and the results will be shown online itself. So in terms of uh, uh, talking to the, be to, it, to the speakers or to the participants, you have got the questions mode in the panel, in the control panel. Uh, you can raise your hands and you can also use the chat. As you might have read in the invitation itself, the objective of the workshop is a bit to highlight the need for skill recognition on a pan-European level. And that is to stimulate mobility, uh, firstly, and uh, I have not, I'm not sure, and fulfill the overarching learning objectives and learning impacts as well. So the, the, the central objective is to get a feedback from you. So we encourage you to actively participate, put forward your comments and questions. So as to the context, it, it makes part of the tasks, uh, let's say the skill development of the BDV. You know, the, it is one of the uh, BDV, Big Data Value, uh, private public partnership projects. And uh, the IT Digital and UPM had worked uh, together to not only to organize this workshop but also in the work itself so you will see the participations so these are roughly uh, these are all our speakers just to show to you uh, and the agenda you have it also and we have divided into two sessions first where UPM and IT Digital uh, present their parts and the second part consists of the uh, let's say the contribution of the, the speakers, experts from industries and uh, universities and public sectors. Uh, there will be a break of 15 minutes at 10.35. Uh, before that, the first session would be moderated by Ernestina from UPM and uh, a discussion will take place. The last round, uh, let's say after the second session, there will be also another uh, another discussion which will be moderated by Anna. So this is all what I have to say at, uh, as, a, as an introduction and I will pass it over uh, if Roberto succeeds uh, to him. I'll pass a hand to him. Uh, uh, yeah, can you hear me? Yes, sure. Yes. Good. Okay, thank you, Moloney. Um, well, I'm glad to be here in this introduction. Actually, I, I had 10 minutes, but I will just uh, use uh, five because uh, Moloney has already explained uh, the context, the main goals of this uh, seminar. And uh, as he said, um, it's based on uh, recognition of skills uh, for data. I don't think we need to spend time on uh, recognizing the skills and needs uh, for big data, but uh, what is important, and this is, I think, the main focus of this uh, seminar today, is that on um, 
the definition of a common uh, ground for a certification accreditation in terms of recognition of uh, not the skills themselves but the way the people could, can get those skills uh, why EAT digital is working uh, on this and this project well, obviously because big data is a topic that is of uh, key importance on our different focus areas but in addition to that, uh, if we talk about education and we talk about accreditation certification, EIT uh, is also implementing models uh, to ensure um, this uh, since the beginning. Um, more than I will uh, cover this in more detail, more detail uh, afterwards, uh, talking a little bit more on what is the EIT label, but just to introduce you a little bit or to those of you that are not familiar, uh, what we are using is a kind, not just an accreditation system for students, for our students of the master and the um, doctoral schools, but also a kind of degree that we provide on top of the degrees that they get through the universities. Well, this is a key element in our education scheme uh, because, um, well, it provides an additional uh, Degree to students uh, that uh, they can then demonstrate that they have got additional skills rather than just the technical ones that you might get from the universities. But also, what is very important from this uh, element is that we have a um, common ground for all the kicks. You know that EIT is based on kicks from different uh, uh, topics and different domains. And with this model, what we have is for all of uh, the kicks and the education and the master and the doctoral school, a common ground on the minimum uh, elements that you need to get. And then you can demonstrate, the students can demonstrate that they have got those skills. Now, EIT is working on the extension of the label to the professional education and also to other areas, um, providing other um, possible approaches to the label through uh, fellowships or through uh, certification. In this context, uh, obviously this uh, seminar today is of a key importance for EAT uh, and also for EAT Digital, because as I mentioned, we are uh, currently working on, on the development of the certification for, for um, professional education and even other uh, programs that might not be part of the label at this uh, moment. Um, it's of the key importance that to receive feedback from the, the, the different stakeholders that participate on education all around Europe. Actually, uh, EAT, is, EAT Digital is also participating in other uh, committees, as you might uh, understand, in which um, we are also uh, fostering the, this, this kind of initiatives because um, this also provides quality and serves quality to the, to the education. Because if you just set up different master programs all through Europe or set up edu professional education without having a, a minimum level of quality and a minimum level of elements, this at the end of the day uh, will not uh, provide the, the, maybe the, the skills that uh, Europe is looking for with a minimum quality level. Um, it's not easy to set up the, the a common ground and a common um, elements to be provided by, by the, the different systems of education. But uh, for us, for EIT uh, Digital, uh, is uh, of a key importance to be able to find uh, these common elements to, to uh, ensure a possible accreditation or certification in our education at all levels, as yes, a master level, at the doctoral level, or even a professional education courses that might be online, might be uh, on campus, might be face-to-face, -face, but at least should contain uh, minimal requirements to uh, provide the minimum needs that uh, we all are looking for. So that's why, well, there are a, number, a few uh, slides that I will not cover because these uh, slides, um, maybe uh, later on you might access to them, but these slides are just um, showing the importance of certification, but again, I don't think we need to spend even a single minute today uh, highlighting the importance of certification for, for everyone, for employers and for employees, because, um, and, and, and just uh, for individuals as well when they receive uh, education. 
Uh, so it's obvious that it's a key element to get a certification, but not only for providing uh, uh, an evidence on the uh, education receipt, but also to ensure that it's, I think, the most important point here to ensure quality uh, education all uh, around Europe in, in uh, very important topics as, as the one we are talking today that is a, a big data. So, as I said before, I am very glad on organizing this uh, or being part of organizing this uh, seminar today. I am sure that we will receive a very uh, useful and positive uh, feedback uh, from all the participants on all, what should be the elements included. Um, we are running um, similar approaches uh, through other areas uh, on the uh, digital horizon. Uh, and uh, we are trying to implement um, the, all this uh, feedback we are receiving uh, at the different uh, focus areas of interest of EIT uh, Digital. So I just want to uh, thank again for inviting me for uh, opening uh, this seminar today. Uh, as I said, I'm sure that we will find useful uh, comments from, from all of you. And I hope also not just the comments, but the presentations that we will provide will be uh, also useful for all us in order to improve the education system uh, all around Europe. So thanks to all of you. Uh, I hope you enjoy the day. Um, and that's uh, all from my side. Thank you. Thank you. OK. Thank you, uh, Roberto. I'm sorry I have a... Uh, <laughs> I was under pressure and uh, forgotten to introduce uh, Roberto. Roberto is, uh, for those of you who don't know him, he is a chief education officer at AIT Digital and uh, a professor of uh, uh, electricity at the University uh, Electronics at the University Universidad Politecnica de Madrid. Thank you. I just, I just, uh, after that, want to. Uh, as an introductory uh, question, uh, launch a poll, which I invite you to participate in uh, before I pass it over to Nick. Uh, so you might see, uh, do you see my question? Have you ever used open the, do, do you see my, not yet, Moruni. I think you ah, oh, now it's okay. It. Now it's okay. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. Sorry. Sorry. Please, 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 please. Yeah. Yeah. The poll is going on. Twenty nine percent yes. Seventy five percent no. So. So. I will. I will in a few seconds close the poll. So the the outcome is 80. The majority of the participants have not used this batch system. So that would be interesting to listen to what Nick is going to say. Yeah, it's moving a bit, but 76% uh, uh, voted. It stands at 85, 15. So not very many have used it. I will close it and launch another another poll. Uh, so the second poll I want to I want to be willing to use them. So so here is a poll. Will you be willing to use them in your company organization? Of course, it's a, a very sensitive question because you have not been exposed to it. Uh, but in any case, uh, it will be a sort of question for the. Uh, to follow, uh, to encourage, follow the the talk of Nick. So, a few seconds. Uh, when at least seventy percent have done it. So, the majority are saying yes. They would like to uh, use it. Forty-five percent, fifty percent voted. But I think sixty percent. The the tendency is that the majority. Let's say exactly at 60% voted, 75% say yes, they would use it, they would be willing to use it, and 25% no. So the details we will see our, after the speech uh, of Nick. Uh, I'll just close it here to save uh, time.
Yeah. So uh, now I will I will introduce Nick. Nick is a professor at the Universidad de Politecnica de Madrid as well, where he teaches and performs research on artificial intelligence. So I will I will I don't think Roberto's done. I will turn to uh, where's Nick? Nick, you are there? You are there? Yeah. Nick already has uh, the control. Ah, good. Excellent. Then the floor is to you, Nick. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, as Mulanay said, um, today I'm going to be talking about um, some work that we've been doing in the BDBE project. Um, the BDBE project is uh, part of the the Big Data PPP and um, is being funded by the European Union. Um, I also would like to emphasize the fact that this work is also being done in collaboration with the Skills and Education Task Force of the BDVA, which is the Big Data Value Association, uh, a nonprofit organization at the European level, which is uh, coordinating and um, serving as kind of the, the political nexus of, in, of both academic and industrial interest in uh, big data. Um, so what I'd like to do today is to talk about the work that we've been doing um, to develop frameworks for the recognition of skills in data science. Um, and I guess the main emphasis of this work is to try to meet needs that are currently, that um, might, not being, uh, might not be being met by existing programs. Um, so the first part, and actually maybe it's maybe one of the most interesting parts because I think it will lend to a lot of discussion later on, is um, to spend some time discussing um, unmet needs from stakeholders. Uh, we've done some interviewing, lots of discussions, lots of talking with people. And we've gathered a list of things that we think um, are properties that would be nice to include in future new or new or future or incorporate into existing uh, skills recognition um systems um, and then i'm going to talk about two uh concrete proposals that we've been working on um, one based upon badges for formal education and another based upon labels for non-formal education um, and before i get started i want to just raise a little bit of a warning um, the notion of label here between eit and this work is slightly different um, there's a relationship but it's not exactly the same and um, maybe discussing the differences would be something that uh, could be interesting. Um, the notion of label that we're using is a little bit more international and not necessarily education-based, uh, but we'll talk about more about that later. So I'll present both of these and at the very end we'll, we'll summarize and talk about uh, what's, what's left to, to do. Um, so the first thing we did was uh, try to think about who the, the main stakeholders in this um, data science uh, education ecosystem are. Um, and we narrowed it down to three main groups of people. Um, first, we have data scientists. So we're talking about um, either people that are in the process of becoming data scientists, uh, learning, uh, people that may be beginning a degree for the first time, or maybe people that have other degrees and are interested in learning about data science, or existing professionals that um, that are interested in um, learning more, or like I said earlier, possibly changing the focus of their work. Um, the second group of people are um, educators, so we'll talk about them in a second. Um, their needs, uh, people that hire data scientists, and the last group of people that we've identified are the, the trainers, the educators, the people that are actually um, providing the education to these either budding or existing data scientists. Uh, so like I said, we've broken what we think these needs are down into three different categories. Um, we've labeled them all here, and I wanted to just talk about them individually, and like I said, later on, Maybe we can discuss um, some of these things as to whether you agree, disagree, and, and so on. So uh, in the terms of needs from the, the data scientists, the people that are receiving the education, um, and like I said, we're, we're emphasizing here things that we think that are not being met adequately or could be met better. Um, and the first is credentials, which are widely recognized. Um, so 
depending upon where you re re um, doing your studies, you might be uh, fortunate to be able to attend um, a university or um, participate in a program that has a lot of name recognition, large, very famous universities, or you might be um, getting your training in a small local place. Um, and especially these later people, um, I think have some interest in um, having the degrees or the certificates or the um, qualifications, the credentials that they're receiving being uh, maybe more widely recognized, especially in the case where there isn't that, that name recognition. Um, another thing that we've heard is that people are interested in having um, credentials which can be easily verified online. Um, we're moving beyond this day where credentials are things that are on uh, pieces of paper and certificates are things that are on people's walls and um, not just having credentials which are digital, we also like to have credentials which are um, verifiable. Um, the next is related to this um, and is uh, related to what I was just talking about, this tendency towards digital. Um, there's also a need to have um, a, a way of displaying skills easily online and in social networks. Um, and here we're talking about um, maybe some kind of standardized, some kind of organized way of, of being able to say, look, I, I have training in data science and this is my training. And for um, people to be able to proudly put that kind of thing into their LinkedIn profiles and so on and so on. Um, and the fourth we've identified from the point of view of data scientists is this uh, mechanisms uh, to recognize uh, skills acquired through informal and non-formal training, which is going to be the focus of the, the second program which we are going to present. Um, from the point of view of employers, um, the first is candidates with credentials that are both granular and individual. Um, so I guess normally people are thought, uh, when you think about candidates, you think about in terms of degrees, certificates, but even within students of the same educational program, um, there are differences. Like some students um, do better, have higher grades, perform better than others, even within the same program. Um, and also in some programs, there are, um, there's quite a bit of flexibility. Um, students, students can select from a large variety of um, elective courses and choose uh, what they would like to focus on. And employers are interested in that kind of information and uh, would like to be able to easily access that in a, in a reliable way. Um, as with the case of uh, data scientists, they're also interested in being able to verify the authenticity of credentials easily on, and ideally online. Um, and the next, I think, starts to tie in a little bit what, uh, to what Roberto was saying. Um, there's also the, um, there's been uh, work done and good work and much progress done to try to combine, um, standardize, uh, produce similar kinds of ways or similar kinds of degrees or certificates throughout Europe. But I think in general, the consensus is that still more work needs to be done and still more work is being done. There are new initiatives that hopefully in the next years will achieve more unification of these kind of credentials. But at the moment, what we've heard is that people still have difficulty comparing um, skills and accreditation throughout the, the European Union. So this is um, an important thing for employers when they have candidates from different uh, member states to be able to help them to understand the differences in the education that they've received. Um, and employers also are interested in influencing the design of training. Um, obviously, they're the, um, the, um, the main consumers of data scientists in our society. And um, ideally, they would like to have data scientists have, who have received the training that they feel that they need to have received for them to be useful part of their uh, businesses. Um, so they're interested in being able to give some feedback to the educational community and, um, and contribute. Uh, they're also interested in a scheme which can quickly adapt to changes in the data science ecosystem. And the third group are educators. Um, and I guess this is the first point is related to what I discussed earlier about students from programs that maybe have less name recognition. These programs are also interested in um, getting some more recognition for their programs, um, either through some kind of accreditation, labeling, um, some kind of like seal of quality, that kind of thing, that they can say, look, we've 
presented our program to some kind of an external or third party um, who is respected and independent, and they've said that we're doing a pretty good job, that, that kind of a thing. Um, also, from the point of view, especially from form, in the case of formal education, um, the, the programs are interested in having recognitions for students who partially complete their programs. Um, at least where I teach, there's not a small number of students who, for example, finish all their coursework, but then they'll complete, for example, their final projects. And it would be nice for um, students to be able to have some credentials, even maybe when they don't complete a program uh, completely, uh, to encourage them to, well, or to be able to display what they to display the, the work that they've done and um, help them, for example, to get employment and help them maybe to finance their studies, that kind of thing, while while they're studying. Um, and the last thing is related to the um, the previous one from employers. They're also in general interested in um, getting feedback from industry and um, getting information regarding what what uh, employers are interested in in terms of the skills that the data scientists that they're hiring. Um, so the first thing we're going to talk about is this um, program based upon badges for formal education. Um, I'm not going to discuss any of the motiv motivations behind formal education because I believe it's probably the most widely recognized and respected kind of credential. Um, and the, the basic idea of this proposal is to provide added value to the existing offer. Um, and um, at the same time, try to ad address these previously discussed uh, stakeholder needs. So the, there are basically three or four key aspects of this proposal. Um, and the first is to use as the credential open badges. Um, open badges are not a, a, a new thing. Um, they've been around for a while and um, they're used quite a bit, especially in um, non-formal and informal education as a way of recognizing um, skills. Uh, we believe that it's something that could be used uh, more widely. Like, there are people that do offer badges as part of degree programs, uh, formal degree programs as well. Um, an open badge is basically just a, an image, like a graphical representation of something that looks like a badge, like a Boy Scout badge or a Girl Scout badge or a military badge. Um, but what's interesting about open badges is that there's an international standard for uh, metadata that is contained within that um, image. And this metadata can provide lots of useful information to third parties, employers, um, and, and particularly employers um, that can help them to make decisions about hiring. Um, like they can have information about things that were studied. And um, one thing that's, that's interesting that a student can do is a student can voluntarily um, provide a link to evidence, for example, uh, related to the work that they did in order to earn the badge. Uh, there's something that employers have told us that they find really interesting, like, for example, being able to see real work that a student did as part of their degree completion is something that employers have said that they would, they would like to be able to see. Um, that's one thing that you can do, uh, along with some others that I'll discuss a bit later. Um, the next aspect is that um, there be a, a group, a small group uh, of experts, a panel. Uh, at the moment, the, the, with the existing proposal, that panel would be... Um, the group of experts from this task force in the BDBA, which, like I said, the nonprofit uh, supporting data science in Europe, um, and that on that panel there be representatives from both industry and academia, and that they would work together to both define and maintain this scheme. Okay, so it's sort of like um, this is the, the 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 nexus that we hope it would provide to allow or to facilitate this communication between um, educators and um, employers. Um, and the third is that uh, badges will not be issued by the, the association or this committee or anything like that, rather by trusted third parties. Uh, so the idea is that individual institutions, uh, universities that offer formal education uh, related to uh, big data would apply to issue badges. Um, there'll be a, a vetting process and application process, applications will be reviewed and universities that are determined um, to meet the requirements of the badge will then be given the, um, the ability to issue badges directly to students without having any intervention of anyone else. Um, and the basic idea here is that if this program would become popular, then, then the requirements um, would influence the overall training of data scientists. Um, like if 
suddenly if, if there becomes if the in, a lot of interest is drummed up if, for this badge program then programs which don't offer badges would be interested in applying and when they would review these requirements set by both industry and academia um, they would then be maybe reviewing making improvements changes to the program to maybe meet those criteria and then that would be achieving this goal of overall improvements of the programs um, there's one that is left out of the earlier ones, but I'm going to be discussing that further on uh, when we discuss the label program. Um, so this is kind of represent, graphical representation of what we just uh, were discussing, the idea that industry and academia work together to design. Um, once an, an individual academic program um, is approved to issue badges, they do so um, after they've determined using their own criteria. Um, what kind of, uh, after they determine that their students have met the, the requirements for the badge, they issue them, then students can display them online, and then that results in this generation of usual metadata that allows them to be both verifiable and um, allow third parties to, to receive more details and interesting information about uh, the content of that credential. Um, so to give you an idea of the skills, these are the six basic skills that uh, we settled upon. Um, and their wording for, for the badge. Um, the initial set of skills was based upon the work of, from the um, Edison project. And um, after a long period of interviews, surveys, feedback, uh, revision, and so on and so on, these are the, the, the skills we, we determined upon. Um, like for example, number three is students are capable of assessing, adapting, and combining data sources to improve analytics. So the idea is that a program, program needs to show that their students can have all six of these skills in order to issue the badge. Um, how does this work? Um, so programs apply. Each individual universe, any individual, Euro, uh, any individual program can apply. Um, applications basically require that they provide a little bit of general information about the program. And then for each of the six required skills, they describe the amount of time they're dedicated to the learning of the skill in the program. And then most importantly, they describe the evidences which are used to confirm the acquirement of the skill. So we're not interested so much in how they teach, but we're interested in how, they're, how they show that they're actually um, that checking that their students uh, uh, are capable of uh, demonstrating the skills that, they've, that they would like them to have. Nick, you have got two minutes. Okay. Sorry. Um, let's see. So we have this issuing badges to students. The um, the idea is that they use uh, an existing badge present badge uh, platform to issue the the badges to their students, um, and students send in an application. The university reviews it, and they can issue them. Um, and students can display the badge, like we discussed earlier on. Um, in their curriculums and so on. Um, this, for example, is uh, a summary of the, of the metadata that uh, is included in the badge. Uh, I won't go into it, but you can see the required skills, the link to the evidence, um, information about when it was issued, who issued it, and so on. The second program that I want to discuss briefly is the, um, the data science training label program for non-formal education. Um, here, when I say non-formal education, what I mean is um, education that is institutionalized uh, and planned by an education provider, but is meant to be either in addition or, or alternative to formal education. Um, in this case, the, the key things we're interested in um, kind of capturing with this program are transparency. So the idea here is to establish a common set of essential data useful for all in the ecosystem. Um, ease the comparison, be able to define a common format to simplify the side-by-side -side comparison. Um, we'd like to be able to unify concepts, like the different things, different ways of just being described, uh, used to describe different skills, and we want to hope to try to unify that and make it be adaptable. Um, so some of these are, this is, some of these concepts are similar to what we we're talking about in, in the badge program. Um, in the case of non-formal education, there's some specific things which um, which are related to non-formal, like, and it's related to just the large offer that there is. Like, if you go online and you try to find an online program for um, learning about data science, there's a huge number. Um, and both for students and industry, it's difficult for them to assess the quality of these programs. 
The basic idea is to take advantage of, uh, or it comes from as an inspiration from other places. So in this case, um, labeling that's, that's voluntary at the moment in the European Union for um, nutritional information. So if you go to the grocery store and you want to buy cereal, these are some pictures of the different kind of nutritional information that are provided on cereal boxes. The basic idea of this label is to provide something similar, but in the case of education. So the idea is that the criteria um, would would include these basic information, the content, like audience and so on, and that it be in the form of a graphical representation. It would be something similar to the label that we showed for the cereal boxes, a graphical, uh, common standardized graphical image that programs could include in their programs that would, um, within, with one just glance, one quick glance, students would be able to see what they, what they want to know from the program without having to dig through the information uh, that the programs provide and hopefully side by side compare them. Um, so let's see, I've been going a little bit fast here in the last part. Um, you are running out of time, Nick. <laughs> Okay, so we presented the two programs we've been working on. Um, if you're interested in learning more about them, uh, here's the web page. Um, what remains really is to uh, obtain the support and um, to obtain some support and branding for these programs. Uh, we've piloted the badge program. Uh, we're working on getting a pilot ready of the, the labeling program, but we think that um, someone with uh, more influence, someone with more name recognition in the uh, ecosystem should um, get involved and um, and maybe uh, provide that kind of backing for it. Um, and I think that's about it. If anyone's interested in um, giving us a feedback, here are our email addresses, or we can discuss more during the discussion part. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you, Nick. By the time you pass it over to me, I will launch one other uh, poll. So, uh, green two. Where is it now? So, you do. You do see the poll? Oh, launch it. So, the question is who would benefit from leveling of courses? So, we had in the first part talked about the badges before even Nick introduced it. Now the labeling, so the labeling that was developed by UPM. So uh, people are voting, 29%, uh, so 100% candidates, 17% uh, course providers, so 38% voted. So please go on, continue to vote. Uh, the tendency is that it would be would be benefit from to for the candidates 100 percent and then 50 percent employers 25 percent course providers. We are at 48 percent voted. So by the time we we reach 60 70 percent, uh, I think we'll stop it. The tendency is very similar, 91% candidates, 64% employers, and 27% course providers. We are at 52%. Just to open for a few seconds more, and then I will close the poll. Uh, Nick, hopefully that you have passed it over to me, the, the sharing for the next participant. So 52%, let me, let me reach 60, at least 60 to 70%, and then I'll close and share the, the results with you. So the, the tendency remains the same. So the first candidate for candidates, then employers, then comes course providers, uh, zero for none. Please continue in three seconds, I will close it and share with you the, the final result and pass it over to the next the next presentation so 57 percent voted just gone <laughs> maybe 60 to 70 percent would be nice uh, otherwise i'll have to close it yeah i will close it close
I will share the, the results with you. So here is what you see, the candidates, 92%, uh, course providers, 25, employers, uh, 58%. I will hide it and then pass it, pass to my presentation. So uh, let me first, sorry to, oh, sharing my screen screen two is there uh, oh. i hope i hope you see my screen i'll put it in the yeah is it okay presenter view no Murray, we are seeing your uh, your notes right now the presentation but just your notes mm -hmm. i don't know what's taking place and now is the same <laughs> the same yes mm. okay i'll once again stop that is what worked last time i don't know if it will work this time then i will do now it's okay but you should go back to the first slide but it's okay yeah okay sorry sorry for uh there there, there we are so my part my topic of presentation is on the it level part so the it level for professionals so uh that has been developed by it the context just to tell you the context uh is it is in line with the ait level for academics that had been already in practice uh for a couple of years so now the idea is why don't we have this up this same approach for professionals so uh it has got its own concepts and principles so the professional one uh with its own processes that we will see and very specific artifacts also also uh, the assumption here is even though there are new entrants into the certification mode, but most of them are professionals who have been in the area. Most of them are graduates already. And that is what, the, what is the assumption behind it. So the idea is to assess the gap between the achieved and intended learning objectives with the learning activities and outcomes to be uh, compared. Uh, so what is what makes it a bit different is I think it's uh, Nick has already explained there is a bit of a, a difference in the approach where at the level that was presented by Nick is to level all the different courses that exist in big data area but this one is specific actually with its own processes quality indicators and so on so uh, the basic concepts are based on uh, the so-called overarching like all englobing uh, learning outcomes uh, on that the, the basics being creativity so you know in Mendel's uh, model creativity uh, is at the top of the learning uh, processes uh, from the different models uh, the value judgment and sustainability, sustainability competence is in there. That is to know the, the short term and the long term uh, needs and uh, and and properties of the 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 the, the certification and the education itself. Uh, innovation of skills to create new improved solutions is one of the basic principles that is in there. And it also normally should enable the intake of transforming skills into let's say capable to take research results into practical problems so there is a relationship between the research results and those to be put in practice in the in the training and the certification itself so one of the best the other basic principles is uh, achieved through the acquiring of the so-called triangles based on knowledge experience and ethics so that is very important in the, in the process. 
uh, and also the learning impacts. There is another dimension that is introduced into this uh, professional certification that is overarching learning impacts. So the impact is very important. So uh, let's say solving problems, uh, staying atop the latest developments for those who participate and follow the certification, uh, they should be able to measure and give results in terms of impact. So themselves to, to know the best, uh, let us say the, the best technology, uh, they should be able to, uh, to improve school sets, skill sets that enable the reduction of costs. So cost is one of it. So it is for the employer, it is for those who are going to use the certified professionals uh, also to increase performance which is one of the important things which is not foreseen in other dimensions so uh, outlet of creativity and ignite passion that is not so simple but is one of the dimensions that is taken up by this approach so uh, the, sorry to uh, interrupt, Murune, but I think yeah. we are seeing only the, the first part of your slide. So we, you are not pa actually passing the, the slide. So we see only the, the, the three bullet, uh, the three, uh, let's say, circles with the arrows. Oh. So probably you're not passing the slide, uh, the slide set. Okay. Now? No, still the same. If you like, I can pass the slides for you. So yeah, please. Let, just let me know. Okay. Okay. Yeah, let's do it. If there so is where a, where are you now? Uh, on this on the second one actually. Okay. One second. The the the, uh, the concepts and principles. So we're talking about the technical and the knowledge and. Okay. I, I hope you see my screen now. Uh, Okay. Anyway, we, just let me know when you, I, I should pass this, the, the slide for you. You can. Yes, okay. and in the, in the second slide. Like okay. So you just go one above. I don't know if you see the right one. Okay, underlying concepts. All right. Okay, that's good. That's good. So we have talked about this learning impact uh, that is focused on the on the customer side and on uh, acquiring the candidate itself, the the best the best knowledge in that terms. Uh, you can pass it to the second. Uh, sorry, yeah. Uh, so I did say the the triangle of uh, through the following as aspects. So we do look into the technical leadership and strategic. So that that is actually from one side to make the candidate himself so agile and flexible so that he can uh, find himself in new situations. But he has got also uh, not only the technical, but the, the leadership to decide at which point he can uh, introduce. You can pass it to the next, uh, Thomas, strategic. Okay. Hands on in, so that is also what makes the, uh, the, the, the competence base know what to do and introduce a bit of the lean and agile, know the optimal way. So that is one of the factors, the principles that we introduce into uh, that it gets solution focused. Okay, not problem focused, rather solution focused. You can go to the next, uh, Thomas. Yeah. So this is a sort of a schematic presentation that I wanted to use just to summarize everything. So on the basis, we have got the, the, the circle that consists of starting from the, uh, let's say data, information, knowledge, and then another, another level we can sometimes call it wisdom. So we, if we go up, then uh, we would see the, uh, to acquire the knowledge, the leadership, and and we have got the strategy and the technical part we pass to the next one uh where the the oh no 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 uh, still on the the previous one uh, thomas on the yeah yeah so uh knowledge on the wisdom side so we have got the the the, the knowledge 
uh, ethics and experience we go up then that is where we do have the output the outcome and be the benefits or the impacts so the the idea is to make an interrelationship of these basic concepts so we can you can pass to the next one thomas so the process what are the processes in here to provide the it level certification for professionals so the first part is for institutions so institutions become candidates uh, there is a system a template and all the whole system that is put in place to do the uh, an assessment and award to institutions that want to uh, of course with the basic information that they require and once they pass all that they are awarded uh, the institution itself is awarded the certification to which the candidates would apply they themselves by the awarded institution get assessed certified and then the third step would be the renewal how they would do the renewal so the renewal would be both for the institutions and for uh, individuals so uh, as i said on the on the on the bottom all the different parts of the process is supported by well-defined templates and sub processes as well so this is a high level of process not the detail uh, you may pass to the next one thomas so uh, this is what make what makes the center of it of, of course in terms of quality assurance so we have got on one side the so-called quality indicators so these are the quality indicators like what are the compulsory requirements uh, the align teaching and IT overarching learning outcomes impacts uh, so there are six indicators they are uh, re reflected uh, they are assessed against uh, the following the following slide thomas yeah the so-called assessment fields so we would have the uh, the first one mobility application so selection admission of students all this would be against the first quality indicator the the green ones rules regulations and so on the details are given are against the the, the second third and fourth indicators and the remaining are uh, uh, on the fifth and sixth uh, quality indicators. So it is a, a, a quite a detailed one whereby the quality assurance should be should be there. Uh, the different sp steps have to be respected and it is only then and there that the institutions are uh, uh, given the, uh, let's say the accreditation to provide candidates uh, their professional certification based on EIT level. Next, please. So the award, just to mention, so that there, there are three parts, the award, the assessment, and then the renewal. In terms of the conditions, uh, there are a couple of them that I have cited, not necessarily to, to retain all these uh, different elements, and the details are in the so-called uh, EIT level uh, prof for professionals handbook uh, so there will be a call for it uh, they will have to uh, give provide hands-on training that they are in a position to give a hands-on training they can teach some of the basic principles that I've, I have mentioned ethical aspects of the subject they base their teaching on the learning triangles those are uh, mentioned technical leadership and strategic foundations they assure the objective of the learning impact so that is customer oriented where they themselves acquire the best knowledge in terms of uh, with time and they are able to reduce the costs and uh, the technical solutions are provided next uh, just to make it quicker uh, assessment so in terms of assessment uh self-assessment that will be the starting point so the guideline would be given then the candidate institution would do self-assessment so on that basis a detailed uh, points are given on that basis the points are given and accumulated given quality indicators against the assessment the assessment fields that i have provided that i have uh, mentioned uh, that there should be satisfactory results 
uh, then there would be a pool of experts that are behind it to do the assessment and do the assessment report as well. So assessment is completed by the, by the report and the evaluation team of the AIT labeling committee as well. Uh, and then we pass over to the next, uh, if you may, Thomas. So once the certification is provided for the institution for a given period of time, uh, then there would be a need for the, for the renewal itself. So the institution will have to renew its certification, the, the accreditation, and the candidate as well. The candidate would be able to receive the accreditation during the validation of the accreditation of the institution. And the, uh, in the renewal process, there are also procedures how to, to deal with it. So uh, self-assessment once again of the institution to the starting point of the renewal should be reassessed again uh, against the quality indicators that I have mentioned, six of them against assessment fields, six of them as well. The assessment covers, so I, 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 I have colored them, but they are, uh, they are regrouped in terms of mandatory, uh, the learning outcomes and impacts and, and uh, after training. So the six of them that I have mentioned in terms of quality indicators, they are regrouped into uh, this. What next? The other question is the next, as we have, uh, Nika have talked about the badges and the labeling approach. Here it is the IIT level approach. So the next steps would be select a piloting profile with the required tasks, knowledge and skills. So contents, in for the big data area have to be developed, select test delivery platform, decide on the exam format, create database of test questions. So that would be the next thing to do. I think there is no any other, uh, yeah. Thank you very much uh, for giving me the time. So if you have got uh, uh, questions and comments, uh, you can follow up with this. I have got one poll to launch, if you may participate in it. So the, uh, the, the idea is what advantage could be gotten from upholding the IT level for professionals? So uh, quality, mobility, or none of them. So did I make a mistake? So 16% voted, a couple of seconds more, just to see uh, what the impressions and the feedbacks of the participants is. So once I reach about at least 60%, I will share with you the results and, and then hand it over to uh, the next moderator so that we can have uh, questions. So we are at 21%. I would encourage you to participate to, to have more say in this, uh, what would be the, the, the elements that one can profit from, does it provide quality or mobility or none of them. But at the same time, you can also offer your, 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 your comments afterwards or uh, questions if you have. Okay. I will, I will close the poll before pausing, passing to Ernestina. So if I may share, that is the, the what uh, has been achieved. So 100% quality, so, uh, and then the mobility. So the mobility elements is lower. So I will stop here and make an introduction 
uh, of uh, the next that will be a discussion. Uh, so uh, Ernestina uh, is a professor at Universidad Politécnico de, de Madrid. So she will be moderating the discussion period. Uh, welcome, Ernestina. Thank you. Can you hear me properly? Mm -hmm. Okay, so well, uh, first of all, thank you for all these presentations. They have been very enriching, very motivating. And in fact, just the certification as it has been said from the very beginning uh, of, uh, by Roberto, it is something that, that we need in Europe just to certify this, these skills and so on. So we have been just discussing, I mean, uh, Mulune and Nick have been talking about different schemas. And first of all, I would like uh, to handle to the, to the audience because I think there was one question by uh, Simone. So maybe uh, you want to, to make your questions al aloud, Simone Aldo? Uh, Simone, I gave you the possibility to unmute uh, yourself if you like. So, if not, uh, I think Ernestina has the question. But if, if you like to make it uh, aloud, just uh, unmute yourself and you can you can talk. Uh, probably she cannot unmute herself. So maybe Ernestina, you can take over. Okay, but the question I don't have it uh, complete. I think it is says that the European call for innovate for digital innovation polls, the HDH, uh, we build a network and work on advanced, but I don't have uh, all the tests, uh, Thomas. Okay, let me uh, read it aloud for you. So the, yeah. she says that the, this is an off-topic question, but uh, the, the, as you said, the European call for digital innovation polls, which is the EIDH, will build a network and work on advanced technologies such as artificial intelligence, IT security, and big data. And the question is, what role will advanced uh, digital skills play in in all this? What, so, what is the role of digital skills in on in all this? That's the question. So maybe Nick, you want to, to reply? Or Mulune? Or well, Roberto? Any of the speakers that has been there want to reply to uh, Simon? Uh, I'll say something. Um, so I think that the um, in the two programs we've been discussing, um, I don't think that we're addressing very, very advanced data science skills. Um, I think that the focus of the badge program is more or less at, uh, at the level of uh, master's programs. It's possible that um, an undergraduate program could could participate and issue badges where there's no specific requirement regarding the, the level of the education the students are receiving. Um, but more or less, we're assuming um, kind of a master's level competency. And I, I don't know whether that would qualify as being very advanced data science skills. Um, uh, maybe in some people's opinion would I, I don't I'm not sure they would um, in the case of uh, the informal um, or the non-formal education program on labels um, this really um, independent of the level so it could be that there is some um, educator uh, corporation university whatever offering very very advanced data science classes and they could uh, ask for a label or it could be that someone is trying to do something very basic and they could also apply for labels. So in, in that sense, I think it's, it's independent about, uh, of the level of the education. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. More questions? I think in the, in, in the chat there were no, no more questions. So I would like, uh, I mean, just to go a little bit deeper into labels because I mean, as, as Nick was suggesting, I mean, we have, uh, well, for, for, uh, um, for masters, for, for all these programs, we have the budgets, but we have been talking about the label, and I would like to go a little bit deeper in this uh, for non-formal training 
because I think uh, some of the things that we will be requiring in the future, in the next future, is just all the uh, um, upskilling in the companies of people that are already working on certain skills and they have to upskill just to have these skills of data science, big data, so on and so forth. So just to go a little bit deeper on the labels and just to see how we can, I mean, which are the main barriers for the schema to go through that this happens to be for the labels and for the budgets. What do you think that are the main barriers and what should be how we can go uh, and do that these schemas that uh, both Molune and, and, and Nick were, uh, were talking about and what, what should be next just to promote them and to make aware of companies and, and academies and well everyone that uh, this framework should be, uh, should be established. So any of you can can reply. I mean, Nick Mulune. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, if I if I may take over, uh, I I have actually cited some of the next uh, steps that have to be followed. But in any case, uh, this is uh, at least from the EIT level contribution side, uh, the EIT contribution side. It is uh, let's say in assuring the, the the environment the framework assuring the quality the let's say the processes how uh, in the big data area but for that matter this is not uh, that's what we are trying to adapt it but it is rather agnostic it could be applied for different uh, areas uh, so that is that is a way how it has to be to be taken i think that that's my 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 let's say my idea nick do you have something else to add um i think that uh, both of the programs are really interesting um and actually i think that there's more similarity between what eit digital is doing as a labeling um and the badge program than between what eit digital is doing with labeling and what we're proposing with the bedv E slash BDVA is proposing as a label. Um, and I think that they both um, have different reasons and um, different um, uh, and complement one another. Um, and I think that um, there's like, it, it could be some interesting discussion relating to what's common and what's different about them and try to see maybe ways that they could be, you know, they could pick up some aspects of, of one another, how maybe one can influence the other and, and, and reverse. So that's something that I think we should try to explore in, in the future. Okay, thank you. So I think we are running out of time. So, well, any other questions that you may have, we can always, I mean, you can always send them to the, to the panelists or, or later. And uh, well, thank you once again to all the panelists. And now I want to remind to the audience that uh, we are going to have a short break, but uh, please remain connected. Do not leave the session because if you leave the session, then you will have problems reconnecting. So please don't leave, I mean, leave the session open. And in, in well, 10 minutes, let's say it is 15. Minutes, yeah. Let's try to make 10 minutes so we go on a schedule. Okay. So right. thanks uh, to everyone uh, again. And I pass the, the floor to, to Mulune. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Ernestina. So as you have said, normally we were, we had foreseen 15 minutes of break, but uh, here we are a bit, a bit behind our schedule. Not very much, but uh, in any case, we have got a reserve time at the end. Uh, but for the speakers to be uh, present on time, uh, we shall try to to catch up with uh, the, the remaining time. So uh, we'll have 10 minutes of a break and then see each other at uh, 10 to, to 11. <laughs>